One of the important questions of physics is what is the origin of mass? Where does mass come from? How does mass arise? In most of our equations, like the Dirac equation, we just assume that mass is there, that it's just intrinsic to the particle. But being physicists, we need to actually look at trying to find, figure out where it comes from for real. Uh, rather than just saying, oh, it's intrinsic, we don't have to deal with it. That's not scientific. And so in the 60s, a theory came about that there was a, heat, a field that gives particles mass. And Higgs was one of the people who uh, came up with that idea. And so it's called the Higgs field. And then there was a Higgs boson to go with the Higgs field, where the boson uh, forms the field that gives the particles mass. And that's where things stand today. Um, and, but the problem is, it still doesn't actually tell us how particles get mass in a direct way. When I was conducting research for my book, um, the zero point universe, I was giving some thought into where mass could come from. And I was inspired, I think, by a story uh, from Dur Paul Dirac. Um, as you may know, Dirac discovered antimatter uh, when he came up with this famous equation, the Dirac equation. In the, his equation, it has a positive and negative energy solution. Uh, mc squared and minus mc squared. And he had no idea what minus mc squared meant. Uh, we don't have negative mass in our world, or our universe, as far as we can tell. And so what, what does this mean, and, and how do both electrons and positrons have positive mass? So he hypothesized back in the 1930s that um, we could have, that they could get mass because they have to push against space filled with quantum fluctuations. And his version of the quantum field, it had electrons and positrons in it, not necessarily in particle pairs as we understand it now. But he still felt like that this energy in space would be constantly pushing an electron, an electron had to push back, and a positron had to push back, and perhaps that is where mass came from. And so I was thinking along the same lines, and I recognized that a proton scatters light and particles. We know the proton has a charge radius. The charge radius is spherical, uh, more or less, as far as we can tell. The charge radius appears to be made of a shell structure of quantum fluctuations. Um, Feynman was the first to come up with the idea of what he called partons, that there were many thousands of little particles and each of these particles could deflect a little bit and that that seemed to describe the scattering behavior of protons if we have all these particles. Now today, um, in the standard model, people say that those particles are quantum fluctuations that are quark pairs and perhaps gluons. And so that's our understanding of proton in the standard model is there's a structure, the spherical structure of quantum fluctuations. Well, in, in my research, I have discovered that it's not quark, but it's actually proton, any proton pairs. But regardless of what you think the spherical structure is made of, there's a real spherical structure that scatters light and that scatters particles. And so the spherical structure must also scatter quantum fluctuations. And electrons are similar, even though people say, oh, the electrons are like point particles, they're really tiny and because of high energy scattering experiments, we don't get scattering. But the thing is that low energy scattering experiments, we do. Uh, there's something called Compton scattering, 
which where the electron appears to behave like it's at the Compton wavelength. And the Compton wavelength is much longer, 2.43 times 10 to the minus 12, while the charge radius of the proton is 0 0.8751 times 10 to the minus 15, although that may be modified here uh, due to the new measurements. So the electron behaves in some circumstances like it's a much larger sphere. And this is also true when you look at the magnetic moment of an electron. The mag when we do the classical magnetic moment calculation of the electron, if you look at that equation, it has the mass of the electron in the denominator. Well, mass isn't used for calculating magnetic moment. But if what you do is instead substitute in the Compton wavelength, you find that the classical magnetic moment of, of the electron is a function of a sphere with a diameter of the Compton wavelength with the charge of the electron rotating at the speed of light. So the electron behaves like it is a Compton-sized spherical shell. And then if you go back and look at a proton, you find that the magnetic moment of a proton is a charge radius size spherical shell that has a diameter two times the charge radius. And if you have that diameter times the electric charge times the speed of light, you get the proton's magnetic moment approximately. There's a small fudge factor called the G factor. So both the proton and the electron appear like they have real physical dimensions that are similar in those respects. So using Dirac's idea, we can go back and say, okay, we'll treat this like a spherical shell. It has a shell, it has an inner and outer diameter. We'll assume that the shell uh, is made of quantum fluctuations, but it can scatter quantum fluctuations. And then we can use the energy density equation for the energy of the quantum field, which is proportional to h bar times omega to the fourth power. And omega is the angular frequency. And you can determine the angular frequency from a wavelength. And you set the wavelength here equal to the distance. And then 2 pi c over d gives us the angular frequency. So we can look at the angular frequency for the inner and outer diameter for wavelengths of quantum fluctuations that are going to be displaced by a spherical shell the size of a proton. And when you do that, you find out that the proton mass is equal to the quantum field energy it displaces. And the electron mass, assuming the electron is the diameter of the Compton wavelength, is equal to the energy of the quantum fluctuations it displaces. There's no way that this is coincidental. And the, the one thing structurally that we are certain of, of the proton, is it has this spherical charge radius. And it turns out the spherical charge radius displaces quantum field energy equal to its mass. Now we can play with these numbers a little bit, the inner and outer diameter, and that's how I did it in order to get the exact number because the shell thickness is a variable. And what you find out, interestingly enough, is that the shell thickness is very close to, or on the order of, the wavelength of a proton-antiproton pair at the pair production energy. And similarly, the electron shell thickness is similar to the electron-positron pair production energy at, for that wavelength gives you the thickness of the shell for an electron. So,
that supports the idea that there's a shell of quantum fluctuations that are rotating such that it appears that it rotates at the speed of light that surround both the proton and the electron. And this is important in terms of coming up with a model of the quantum structure of the electron, which I talk about in my book, uh, Goodbye Quarks, The Onion Theory. So, the mass of the electrons and protons, and by extensions, neutrons, because neutrons have the same dimensions as the protons, essentially, the mass of all three of those is due to the displacement of quantum fluctuations. So the Higgs field is really the quantum field. There is no special Higgs field to account for it, and there's no special Higgs boson to account for it. Now there is the case of all the hundreds of unstable particles, and how do they get their mass? And that's different. Um, and that goes back to something, a, a relativistic positron solution. And I don't want to go into detail here, but very briefly, a positron has an electron and positron, positronium has electron and positron orbiting. And it's in a balance temporarily when the centrifugal force of the orbit is opposed by the Coulomb attraction between the positive and negative charge. And when they're briefly equal, the positron becomes stable for a brief period of time. Well, in 1948, Milne came up with a solution that there's a relativistic solution. Uh, but most people missed it, and it was rediscovered in 1960 by Sternglass and Feynman. Uh, Sternglass had been working on a, a, the idea of a pion model being made of an electron and a proton, and Feynman suggested that he model it as an electron positron first. And so Sternglass worked it out in Feynman's office, and they went through the derivation, and they figured out that a relativistic electron positron pair has the mass of a neutral pion. So it's essentially a classical model of the neutral pion. And, but in this case, the mass energy is relativistic. Well, I took Feynman's pion, Feynman and Sternglass's pion model and extended it to all the unstable particles and found out they can all be described as unstable resonances, onium-type orbiting resonances of other part of electrons and protons, and then other particles that are made of the electron and protons that are orbiting. So you can have orbiting particles that are orbiting. Um, and this comes about because there's a quantization of energy of particles at 35 MeV per C squared and at 70 MeV per C squared. And that quantization energy is the relativistic energy, uh, relativistic orbital energy. Um, and additionally, there's a relativistic orbital energy for protons, where you take the fine structure constant times the mass of a proton, and it gives you 128 GeV per C squared, which is essentially the mass of the Higgs boson. So what scientists think they discovered and have labeled the Higgs boson is nothing more than a relativistic proton. Now I described that model in much greater detail in my book, Goodbye Quarks, the Onion Theory, and uh, I have links to that in the description as well as my other books. And if you want to learn about more about quark theory and quantum theory, you can purchase one of my books. The key thing here is that the origin of mass is the displacement of quantum fluctuations. In the case of electron and proton and neutron, it's a direct displacement in line with the spherical shell model. In the case of the unstable particles, it's 
those particles being relativistically accelerated so that they have relativistic mass in addition to their rest mass, which is determined by the displacement of quantum fluctuations. And that's where mass comes from. That's the origin of mass. Well, if you like this article, please like, share, subscribe. And I'm an independent researcher, retired. Uh, so if you'd like to support my research, then please uh, consider giving me a contribution on my Patreon account. As I said, I have my books here, and there are links in the um, description. I also have a link in the description of a paper that, that goes through the details in case you're interested in that. So thank you very much for watching.